Hello and welcome to the kickoff for SWOG 1404. This is an adjuvant trial comparing interferon to pembrolizumab in resected high-risk melanoma. My name is Kenneth Grossman and I'm the study PI and first of all I would like to thank you for participating in this important trial. During this talk you will hear about the study including its background, overview, and statistical design, registration steps necessary, data and sample submission, patient reported outcomes, imaging, quality control, and study monitoring. A brief introduction to the informed consent process and finally acknowledgments for all the hard work which went into developing this study. The intended audience for this includes anyone conducting the study at a SWOG, ECOG, or NCIC site. Those personnel would include CRAs, data managers, and principal investigators. By way of background, it is notable that stage 3 melanoma carries with it a poor prognosis, with a five-year overall survival of approximately 50%. Relapse in melanoma can cause morbidity and mortality, with over 50% of melanoma relapses occurring at distant sites. Presently, the only FDA-approved treatments for adjuvant therapy in the U.S. include high-dose interferon and pegylated interferon. Though ipilimumab may receive approval during this time window, it does have notable long-term toxicity, which may limit its use. Interferon, or high-dose interferon, has been selected as the control arm of this trial. It is the only treatment to date in melanoma that has shown both an overall survival and relapse-free survival benefit in multiple randomized controlled trials for those with high-risk resective disease. It has well-established management algorithms that define dose reduction and treatment cessation in response to toxicity. We expect for this trial, the community of oncologists conducting it will be well-versed in the management of the drug. If there are further questions about unique toxicity scenarios not easily answered by the protocol, please contact the study chair. The experimental agent that has been selected for this study is called pembrolizumab. It is a PD-1 inhibitor and has shown exceptional response rates and safety in stage 4 unresected melanoma. Of note, responses were seen in about 30 to 40 percent of previously treated patients in a pivotal phase 1 study. This data has been demonstrated in subsequent work in the frontline and secondline setting. The adverse event profile is favorable and also has well-defined management algorithms available in the protocol. Objectives of this study include overall survival, which will be accessed for the whole study population as well as the PDL1 subgroup, and relapse free survival for the same two subgroups. Toxicity will be assessed as well as quality of life endpoints measured by the FACT BRM and EQ5D instruments. Pharmacokinetic and ADA testing will be done on patients receiving pembrolizumab to better understand how this drug performs in the adjuvant population. Finally, tissue banking will be an optional objective which patients may choose to participate in. Of note, for the current correlatives in the E1609 adjuvant trial, 91% of patients have agreed to banking and 81% have actual tissue, so our expectation for tissue collection for this study is high. This study design is a simple one-to-one -one randomized open-label trial comparing pembrolizumab, or MK3475, dosed at 200 mg IV every three weeks for one year. This is being compared to high-dose interferon delivered at 20 million international units per meter squared per day, IV days 1 through 5 for four weeks, followed by a maintenance phase of 10 million international units per meter squared per day, subcutaneously every other day, three times each week, for up to 48 weeks. Entry criteria includes the patient being surgically resected with adequate margins. This is defined in detail in the protocol. AJCC staging will extend down to 3A and 2 disease, with patients eligible all the way up to fully resected M1C disease provided there are no brain mats. To be eligible, patients must be at least 18 years of age and they must have completely resected melanoma as described in this slide. No prior treatments are allowed. Prohibited prior treatments would include any chemotherapy, vaccine therapy, or other therapy directed towards melanoma. Adjuvant radiation is allowed and must be completed within the day 84 time window of surgery to the first dose of study medication. Patients with HIV disease are allowed and encouraged to participate in the trial, provided they have adequate CD4 counts, which is described in the study documents. Patients must be randomized within 16 weeks of the surgery and must have no autoimmune disorder or hepatitis B or C. Again, no prior immunotherapy is allowed, and the pdl one assay must be performed and reported prior to enrollment of the patient on the trial. It is important to note that the pdl one results will only be available to the patient and the study team following completion of the trial. This study will require 1,000 
240 eligible patients, and we estimate up to 1,378 enrolled to achieve this, as a 10% ineligibility rate is anticipated with the study. There is a one-to-one -one randomization between the two arms with 620 eligible patients per arm. The primary endpoints include overall survival and relapse-free survival. To achieve this, we anticipate three years of accrual at 45 to 50 patients per month. This number being estimated from prior adjuvant studies conducted within the cooperative group. Final analysis will be expected within two additional years of follow-up. The analysis plan for this study includes two interim analyses for overall survival at 55 and 80 percent of deaths. This is expected to occur at approximately study year 4 and study year 3. The final RFS analysis at 100 percent of RFS events is expected to be at year 3.5. No interim analysis for RFS or PDL1 positive subgroups will be performed. For registration of patients, they must enter this study through normal screening procedures, and slides must be submitted for PDL1 testing. Once PDL1 testing is complete, sites will receive an email from SWOG that indicates that the testing was done and the patient can be randomized. No PDL1 information will be relayed to sites or patients. The patients will be registered from randomization within seven days and subsequently manner treatment. In this section, we're going to discuss steps you'll need to take to randomize a patient on S1404. Before you can register your first patient, you must pre-order kits for PDL1 and PK ADA testing. These initial orders can be placed through the SWOG specimen tracking system found at this link. Here is a screenshot of the login page for the SWOG specimen tracking system. If you're a SWOG member, you can log on with your SWOG roster ID number and password, or anyone can log on using their CTSU user ID and password. Once you've logged on to the SWOG specimen tracking system, you'll see the special link for S1404 at the bottom of the page as indicated here with a big red arrow. Click on this link to begin the process for your initial order of kits. Enter your contact information on the S1404 specimen kit page. Be very careful to enter your fax number correctly as this is the primary means of communication by PPD. When you are finished, Click Save. By doing so, you'll have placed your initial order for your kits. For SWOG sites, the contact information will be pre-filled based on the current data in the SWOG roster. Your contact information can be updated at any time through this link on the SWOG specimen tracking system. However, entering information through this link will not make any changes to the SWOG roster. It is only data for this particular study. Your initial order will contain four PDL1 kits and three kits for PK ADA blood samples. These should arrive within 10 to 15 business days of placing your order. Plan accordingly and give yourself enough time. Along with your initial kit order, PPD will assign you a username that you will need to log into their website. When you log on to the website, you can create your own password. All subsequent kit orders must be placed through the PPD website using your assigned username and password. patient must be registered to the screening step of S1404 before submitting tissue. Confirm that the patient meets all of the criteria listed in Section 5.1 of the protocol prior to registration. Do not register more than three days prior to the date you plan to submit the tissue specimens. 
remember to submit all of the data specified in section 14.4 immediately after registration. After you've registered to the screening step, you can submit tissue for PDL1 testing. Submit five unstained slides to LabCorp as outlined in section 15.2 of the protocol. The slides must be freshly cut, meaning they must be shipped within seven days of being cut from the block. And remember, all shipments must be logged into the SWOG specimen tracking system. When you register to the screening step, you'll have provided an email contact. Within 10 business days after your specimen submission, this email will receive a notification whether or not the tissue specimen was adequate for PDL1 testing. However, sites will be blinded to the patient's PDL1 results. If the email indicates the tissue was adequate for PDL1 testing, then you can register your patient to the randomization step to receive a treatment arm assignment. If the email indicates the tissue was inadequate for PDL1 testing, you may submit another kit for this patient in an attempt to get PDL1 results. When you register to the screening step, you'll have provided an email contact. Within 10 business days after your specimen submission, this email will receive a notification whether or not the tissue specimen was adequate for PDL1 testing. However, sites will be blinded to the patient's PDL1 results. If the email indicates the tissue was adequate for PDL1 testing, then you can register your patient to the randomization step to receive a treatment arm assignment. If the email indicates the tissue was inadequate for PDL1 testing, you may submit another kit for this patient in an attempt to get PDL1 results. Once you know that you have a specimen that's adequate for PDL1 testing, you may register your patient to the randomization step and receive a treatment assignment. The data and sample submission are well detailed within the protocol with section 14 of the protocol containing instructions for data submission and section 15 containing instructions for sample submission. This includes instructions for PDL1 testing, tissue banking, PK and ADA sampling, quality of life administration and image submission to IROC. Patient reported outcomes will be done throughout the trial as they directly measure the effect of a treatment on the quality of life from the point of view of the patient. Treatment related toxicities are likely to impact these patient reported outcomes. For adjuvant therapy, our main goal is to improve survival without any deterioration of quality of life, so the measurement of the patient's perspective is very critical. Two instruments will be used in the trial, and these include the FAC BRM, which has been used in other SWOG adjuvant trials as well as the EQ5D. Details of these documents should be uploaded from the SWOG site. PRO instruments will be administered at baseline, week 4, week 13, and every 12 weeks while in treatment. Following treatment cessation, there will be a 24 and 48 week administration of the instruments. At relapse, the PRO instruments will be administered as well. All participants will have brain and body imaging with PET CT, standard CT imaging, or MRIs at baseline pre-treatment. They will also have scans done every 12 weeks until 2 years from randomization and then every 6 months until 5 years from ram randomization. PET CTs and or MR images must be locally read and interpreted by the local site, Radiology Services. For brain imaging, MRI with contrast is the preferred imaging option. If PET CTs are used, a CT with contrast should be submitted in addition to the FDG PET images. If IV contrast is contraindicated, then a CT scan without contrast of the chest and an abdominal MRI are the preferred imaging modalities for whole body imaging. Imaging exams must also be submitted to the Imaging and Radiation Oncology Core, or IROC, via the triad system for quality control and image banking purposes. 
Quality assurance will require mandatory training of key site personnel prior to the first person being registered at the site. In addition, mandatory centralized training will be done if major changes to the protocol occur or common problems are occurring during the monitoring and or audits of the study. There will be oversight through routine auditing and monitoring using a risk-based approach to monitoring as is common for all SWOG studies. Quality assurance will also require one full-time SWOG monitor to be dedicated to S1404 for routine monitoring and monthly communication between the monitor and site staff to assess for potential problem areas, provide feedback, and to identify staff turnover issues. Centralized electronic monitoring will also be done through the SWOG statistical office, as well as on-site monitoring as needed. Centralized monitoring will involve review of submitted data, verification of critical source documents remotely via collection, and review of pathology, radiology, and applicable lab reports. Analysis of site characteristics with performance metrics will identify sites with poor performance or noncompliance through the SWOG institutional performance reviews, metrics, and other available reports. Finally, sites will be evaluated for their timeliness of serious adverse event reporting, timeliness of data submission, verification of specimen submission, and off-site review of investigational drug accountability and record keeping on a biannual basis. The informed consent process is straightforward with all patients required to complete informed consent discussion and sign consent with study procedures which include PDL1 staining. Patients may opt in to have their tissues banked for future research and we are hopeful most patients will agree to this. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the hard work of many collaborators on this project. Tony Rebus and Vern Sondak have provided wonderful leadership and mentorship to me during the development of this protocol. Megan Othis and Jim Moon have worked extraordinarily hard on the statistical design and data input methods required for the study. Their work has extended well beyond this in many areas, and their expertise and experience have been invaluable assets at every phase of protocol development. Sapna Patel, my study co-chair, will be the lead investigator for the study's quality of life component. Jamie Barrett will be the Clinical Research Data Coordinator for the study. Val Guild has been a steadfast proponent of the study and her input has always been appreciated by our group staff. John Kirkwood and Amon Tarhini have significantly influenced this study's design with insights gained from significant experience acquired during the conduct of E1609 and other studies within the Eastern Cooperative Group. Teresa Petrella will be the NCI Canada study chair. Michael Knopp and his team from IROC have built a terrific structure to allow central banking of all imaging data related to this protocol, which will be a first for our melanoma committee. Emmett Schmidt has been a key scientific contributor for Merck in the design and opening of the study and has helped assure that the study, should it be positive, have all of the necessary components for drug registration in the U.S. and Europe. And finally, our CTEP collaborators, Elad Sharon and Howard Streichler, have been most helpful in assuring success with the design and activation of the study. Most of all, I wish to thank you for your attention to the details of the study and wish you a warm welcome to the S1404 study team.